good afternoon, gents. Yeah, yeah, so so what I want to talk about first is the radio shows. It's a cult radio show, and unlike radio shows, not many people playing that kind of music. No, I mean, when, when I first started doing it, um, I wanted to play stuff that, that came from my sort of teenage years, what I was listening to, and then what's going on now. Um, and then fortunately, it got better when, not that I'd run out of music, but it got better when Carvers came on board. And I think the, the umbrella of styles that we now cover is even bigger. So from that perspective, um, it's been a great journey. And, and similar, the show is similar to perhaps the Freak Zone, um, Stuart McConey, that, that would be the closest to it. But we like to think sometimes we're, we sort of can go off on more of a tangent. Freakier zone? Well, possibly, I don't know. We, it's a difficult one, isn't it? We've told Stuart that we, we really are after his job, and, and if he ever falls down a wishing well, he knows where the thought came from. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but he's on board with that. He's okay with that. Yeah. So he's all happy you to push him down a wishing well. He's, yeah, he's yeah. happy about that, yeah. He's just, he just minds buses. He doesn't go near a Ouija board. <laughs> the way you actually met actually fits his story so perfectly. You actually met at a Magma gig in Paris. We did, you? yeah. In about, what was it, two, 2002, 2003? Yeah, I'd seen, I'd seen Steve at Magma gigs in the UK, of course, because uh, everyone knows he's a Magma fan. But then, yeah, Magma was doing like this residency in this small place outside Paris. And uh, my, well, I guess we were probably the only British people there. My wife just went up and said, oh, let's talk to Steve. And uh, then, you know, we'd sort of carried on chatting, went out for a drink that evening and pretty shortly were pals after that. And uh, it turned out I'd sort of joined, uh, uh, I was in a couple of bands that Steve knew anyway, I think. Um, which bands? Well, Cardiac and then uh, Guapo, which Steve already knew. So, uh, and I realised, you know, you know, getting to talk to him, we had very, very similar taste in music. And actually the stuff that he didn't know about that I turned him on to and the stuff that I didn't know about that he turned me on to was exactly the stuff that was up my street sort of thing. <clears throat> Yeah, it was quite funny. Uh, we, were, we were at the, the, the concert in Paris and, and uh, he said, oh, I'm in a band. And I went, oh, lovely, thinking it would be some sort of pub band, you know. He said, oh, we're playing soon, if you want to come along. I, at the time, I didn't, I'd not really heard too much about the Cardiacs. I didn't, so all of a sudden, I've rolled up at the Astoria, not really knowing where I was going, thinking, oh, my mate's in the band, it'd be great if I must be in one of the small rooms or something. Next minute, there he's on stage with Tim Smith, on stage, 1,500 people all giving it all that and eyes and in the, in the, in the pit and everything. And I thought, my mate on stage, what's going on? <laughs> oh, it's a proper band. <laughs> it was a, yeah. and then, it's and, the first time anyone's yeah, called Cardiac's a proper band. Actually. It's, <laughs> it's a proper band. It's, and it was a brilliant, uh, brilliant concert. I'm, I'm so uh, pleased that I got the chance to, to see because obviously, sadly, there's no more Cardiac's uh, uh, gigs going on. But it was a, it was a great experience. And, and of course, then Carvis... Um, uh, had already got the band Knife World together. I invited him on the radio show to sort of, you know, come and play your music and choose the music. And I think it was a two hour show. You brought 80 CDs. Yeah, didn't you? yeah. 80 <laughs> CDs for a two hour show. And these aren't short tracks. <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah, just to be had all bases covered. It's very high fizz. <laughs> and, uh, and, I, and I said, oh, that was great. I really enjoyed it. Because yeah, I've, I've been doing radio show and your, I mean, your own is boring after a while. Mm. So it was great. He went, oh, you loved it. I'll come on again. And then it's every week now, so it's brilliant. Yeah. It's, it's moved on now. So it's kind of the way you sort of leave this before, but the way it works is that you, you've, you've very much got the music you're into, and it's quite diverse. So you've techno, it's Northern Soul, and, and, and prog. And do you find that you get to a point where you kind of, you've heard everything, you sort of listen to a lot of stuff, and, and Carvos is bringing a whole new raft of music in for you to get turned on by? Well, what happened was the radio show was the direct influence of me sort of more or less getting rid of my soul moving it to one side and going back to what I used to listen to, which was a lot of the Zoom music and a lot of uh, French progressive rock and some prog rock, but not too much. Not, not the yeses and the genesis. Gentle Giant was probably my favourite, but some of the Henry Cow, all the Canterbury, Hatfield and the North stuff, that would have been the stuff I was more intro, interested in. Um, the, the electronic stuff didn't happen till a lot later, my interest in it. And it's, it's only a mild interest in the word techno as a broad umbrella. I'm more interested in some of the electronic artists like Alteca and, uh, and, and Carl's put me on to, to Alteca because they're more psychedelic -y than Boof Boof. So um, even though I like soul music, all of a sudden I got back into the stuff that turned me on when I was a, a kid, gone back to my roots. And I think a lot of people do actually go back to a time in their life when they 
where they really sort of romanticise about the music they listen to. And they may and they revisit it, which is, you know, nostalgia comes into the equation, I think. Is it like listening to it with different ears when you go back to it? Um, I think I did, actually. I mean, I, I remember my best schoolmate, he was a Frank Zappa and Beefheart fan. And at the time, I wasn't particularly bothered about Beefheart and not a lot, a lot of the Frank Zappa. But going back to listening to it, I appreciated it more, perhaps with, uh, with more mature ears or perhaps more of an open mind. But mm. at the time, I was more into my little, you know, Gentle Giant, Magma, and they were my bands, you know. So, so Beefheart was your, your yeah, doorway band, wasn't yeah, it, that it was got a, you into the weird world? world. Yeah, yeah, there was, a, it's like a, I suppose, Trap Mask Replica, such a gateway record, because it, even 40 odd years later, it's still just completely sort of divisive. And people, some people really hate that record. And it's kind of, <laughs> I think it's the first time I, I sort of realized, oh, God, you, oh, you can do this. Oh yeah, this 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 is music as well, and it's yeah. So where had you been before that? Well, I've been sort of um, look, it was the eighties, and I was just generally into music. So it was anything from, I thought, really exciting stuff like kind of Slayer and Metallica, and then the Jesus and Mary Chain, the Smiths, and then a little bit, some of a little bit of what was going on in the creation world, but then also what was going on with like the British grindcore stuff like Carcass and Napalm Death was really really exciting, and then but then it sort of got more into sort of had a bit of a kind of epiphany around the late 80s with Cardiacs and that sort of blew up everything and became much more interested in kind of psychedelic stuff like from like the White Noise and Sid Barrett stuff and then Steve Reich and just and John Zorn and Stravinsky and I think it all changed at the late 80s when, you know, when sort of, I think Cardiac sort of opened that door and my ears just heard, oh, anything's, you know, anything is possible. It doesn't have to be this sort of rigid guitar, bass and drums sort of thing, it can just be anything. And it's original, sometimes unfairly get to lump, get lumped in with what we do with prog rock because some of what we play is that. But I think a lot, a lot of that stuff's really horrible, you know, and a great deal of it, like most music. But I think it's more just sort of the idea of playing music where anything can happen, you know. It's absolutely kind of just sort of following this really honest path and, uh, you know, it's, it's that kind of stuff, really. I think it's the difference between people who... who claim to you know, not claim people who say oh, I love prog rock and they'll and Genesis and yes or people who say yeah I listen to prog rock Henry Cow mm. and that's that's the route yeah it's, it's, it's and they're massively different is I it think. like prog or progressive or even psychedelic in a sense this yeah. music is actually true well it all came under the same umbrella so but mm. therein lies the problem of any any umbrella of, of you know that, that defines the style of music you, you get you can get grouped in the wrong the category in the in the record shop and never get so, never get discovered. So if you went in a record shop, you should Henry Cow should be anywhere near Genesis in the record shop. It should be different bits. Mm. It's funny though you said about <laughs> psychedelic because I think as a as a term, I think psychedelic is a lovely catch-all for anything from, like I said earlier, for anything from sort of Bartok to kind of My Bloody Valentine. I think it's it's all head music, right? I mean, it's just completely. It's a great catch-all. It's a shame. Well. It's a shame that sort of the word psychedelic kind of also refers to this generic kind of fuzz tone, you know, which don't have a problem with kind of kind of garage sort of rock. And people say, well, that's psychedelic. Whereas I think it's a, it's a much lovelier catch-all for anything that's sort of far out and mind revealing. Kind no, of I, I like the way you talk about Otaka. Yeah. And, and Henry Cow and Magma it's, it's and Juice Air Chain in the same it's conversation. It's all psychedelic music, right? Yeah. Yeah, totally, yeah. You that know. completely makes sense to yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Mary Chain was a great... Um, Gateway to into noise because I mean it's, it's I mean that stuff you know psycho candy it's only really cowboy chords it's like C G and D but just with these sheets of you know amazing feedback over it and that's kind of that was another kind of oh yeah oh you can do it like that yeah you can that racket can be a, that racket can be beautiful you know and that was another sort of wake up moment I think seeing them on um, whistle test was like my Sex Pistols on uh, that was I was too young for you know on the uh, is it Ted, Ted Grundy show? You know, Bill Grundy, Bill yeah. Grundy Ted, yeah. Yeah. Ted, Ted Bundy, Young. I was thinking of... Ted Bundy yeah. show, that, that yeah, would be a show was say, was on the Ted Bundy show, yeah. <laughs> young, but that was, my, that, was my, that was my one. I remember, you know, at school watching the whistle test, they came in a trash day gear, and the next day at school, I was like, God, did you see, see the Jesus and Mary show? That was amazing, you know, so... Actually, did you have a moment like that, Steve? Is there a specific TV moment or a specific record that you learned <clears> that totally... Um, well, well my, my biggest moment, I, I, I mean... 
at part, I went down the soul route. It's weird how I went down that. I just sort of, I don't exactly know how it all panned out now. But um, but I was in the London area. There was yeah. The, you're from Romford, aren't you? Yeah. Yes. So so the um, so all of the pirate radio stations were pumping out like Horizon and, and Jazz FM or uh, J, uh, I think it was JFM before that. I was trying to think what it was, but a lot of like rare groove soul stuff. And I got carried away down that road from. I went from the likes of soft machine jazz rock stuff. So then jazz funk, you know, George Duke stuff and all of the, you know, Chick Corea, Mahavish New Orchestra, and all of a sudden then to more the, the, the vocal end of it, then started listening to Robbie Vincent shows. And I was a soul boy throughout most of the 80s. And, and whilst I enjoyed my time in that world, and I still love the music, I feel like it was a bit of a narrow thing to start to only concentrate listening on. And I missed out so much of that period of time. So Magma 1975, Chalk Farm Roundhouse, Teenager, blown away by watching these mad men on stage. So how, how's, how does a teenager who's into jazz funk end up at the roundhouse watching Magma? Did somebody take you down there? No, I was already, no, I was, I was, that, so the, the jazz funk stuff was after, mm. you know, that okay. shit careers yeah, yeah. that came yeah. later on. But from, from the oh, age... Did you hear them on John Peel? First, yeah, right? things yeah. like, yeah. So, yeah. From, so from 1970 onwards, I was like, you know, soaking up sort of, you know, that, that style of music that was coming in. And, and along the way, the Magma concert was my revelation, watching these people like on stage playing music I'd never ever heard or anything like it. N and nothing that Canterbury music was really putting out was like Magma. Perhaps Hatford and North had moments of it, but, uh, and then all of a sudden I was a Magma fan and that then, that polarised a little bit of my listening. So I went down a lot of French stuff, you know, other bands that, that did uh, music similar to Magma. Uh, and, and went down that road until all of a sudden I got hijacked by soul and I dropped it all and I'm so upset that I never continued. So I've got this massive big gap <laughs> uh, of music that I would have probably have, have, have like delved into. In, in chronological order. Have you gone, yeah. back to, you've gone back to it though? I've gone back to it, yeah. But yeah. So, so a, a lot of things are missing. So then I've got this big, big gap and then all of a sudden somewhere down the line I decided to go back to doing a radio show which was about the style of music before. But that's like you know, 20 years past. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so in a sense, in a sense the, the radio show is an attempt yeah, to, to, to make amends, to, to, yeah. to, to apologise. <laughs> actually, one thing that's sort of happened over at least the last, I'd say, six years of doing it is that ninety percent of what we play is like current. You know, we, it's, we sort, yeah. I think we worked through the first couple of years. We sort of basically it was like two guys showing each other their record collection. So each week, you know, we'd come in with about an hour's worth of music. He's oh, you ever heard this? You ever heard that? And that was the radio show. And then when we sort of exhausted that, we kind of, you know, started playing more and more new stuff. But I'd say about 80 or 90% week in, week out is stuff from whatever year, you know. The, you know so we're currently playing, you know, our, our albums of the year, which has been like sort of Teleplasm East and uh, James Holden and The Animal Spirits and Cheer Accident and Prescott and that, that kind of thing. And then and getting a lot of these bands on as well as guests, which has been really cool. So it's an important part of the show to be going forward. Yeah, 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 well, yeah. well it's, it, it's given me an excuse. I mean, not that I really need one, but you can, you can get lazy about listening to new stuff, but we kind of have to. We've sort of given ourselves this job as being, to some degree, kind of not saying that we're the... Um, you well, know, we're, we're not directing the Stuart McConey. We're, we're not the Stuart sort of, McConey. Yeah, we're, we're not the sort of doyens <laughs> of knowing what's going on, but certainly we've got this... Uh, We've got this funny taste and we, we, we happen upon this funny stuff that uh, not too many other people are playing. But... It's, this is a massive problem that I'm, I'm really struggling, apart from the fact that we don't know all of the great music that's coming out of China, you know, around the world. You don't know what is out there that you might, you might be missing. So another year goes by and there's great albums. How much time do you spend listening to new music as opposed to listening to your favourites? Do you have to? Well, is it discipline? Do you, do you make well, yourself a single? Well, music? it's just, uh, I'm interested in new music and it's great to champion the calls of new artists and bands and, and anything that's coming out. And you, have, you listen to that. But how many times do you listen to a great album from the past when you're also listening to it's It's, it's a dilemma, well, isn't well, it? You know, Henry Rollins only listens to new music in the week. He'll only listen to old, old music at weekends. In the week, he only listens to stuff he doesn't know. So, so you have to like almost make yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do, yeah. So he just forces him to Two do that. sevenths of his life he's listening when he's, to old when stuff. When he's working out. <laughs> we have to listen to the old stuff to put the new stuff into a context. Yeah. See yeah, if you love it as much as yeah. the old stuff, I guess, don't you? Yeah. I mean, I mean, I understand why you do this because you're a musician, aren't you? Yeah. And I know a lot of musicians definitely don't listen to new music and stay in their own little circle, but it's good for musicians to listen to new stuff. But I'm interested in why you do it, Steve, because obviously you're a musical fan. 
But really, it's, your day job is, uh, is playing snooker, isn't it? And it's, uh... Yeah, that's been part. It's been my life. Uh, it's, I don't think I really have any choice in the matter of what I've listened to. I've not, I've not, it's not made a conscious decision to say, oh, I want to listen to weird stuff. It's, it's picked me. Mm. Um, and the, the route you go down, you, you don't have any control over that, I think. Uh, but I do, I do feel that the, the radio show has, um, has, has made me appreciate the responsibility of getting some airplay for some artist that would never get on any other shows. And it's so hard to, you know, for normal mainstream radio doesn't do it. So it, it's, been, it's, been a, it's been an honour in a way to do a radio show where we played so much funny music on. And um, yeah, so, so I'm, not a, you know, I'm not a musician at all, but I just, I'm a fan. You know, I'm not a massive anorak. I just go, here's another one of my favourites. I mean, Usually Carvis yeah. talks about, you know, more expertly. I go, here's another one of my favourites. Well, I absolutely yeah. love them. But I don't think it has to be, music doesn't have to be deconstructed to be, no. you could just listen to the outside. But I'm just kind of interested in this idea that, that you don't have to do this. You could just play music as a fan. You could just sit there endlessly playing 70s prog records yeah. or whatever and say, well, I loved all this kind of stuff. But to, this actual quest to find new things. Well, I'm not, I'm not a media slut. In a, you know, as much as I'm not, I don't want to be in front of the cameras. Uh, obviously, I want to be now. No, uh, uh, <laughs> it's all right. Well, I'll you out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, right. I've had my fill of that. I don't need that. But I just, uh, I just quite like radio, and I've done it for so long. I quite enjoy the fun of it, and the, it's quite free in a way. You know, I, I mean, to be a radio presenter, and you have to play a playlist. You, you just want to slit your throat. Mm. But to have the choice, I'd only do a radio show where you choose, you chose all the music. If somebody said, you've got to play this, then I'd be out the door. So it is a little bit like, we all want to make mixtapes for people, don't we? Yeah. We all want to give, we all want to put our music on, say, hey, have you heard this? So it's probably an extension of that, really. Do you, do you find, I'll just come oh, say, right. but do you find it's quite a schizophrenic existence in a way? Because <laughs> to, to be fair, the snooker world doesn't really seem like the kind of world where you're going to hear much. Pe many people talk about magma, are you? No, no, there's not many people talking about magma. It's any? Like none. No, um, not not any. No, you won't. You won't even hear too many people talking about Frank Zappa or Captain mm. Beefheart either. Um, yeah, they're, they're totally different worlds. But I think that's quite nice to have a you know, a sport or you know doing something like that, which is like a very controlled thing. It's, and it's nice to have hobbies away from it. And and this was my hobby, which is the other side of it. And I've 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 always been really interested in weird and wonderful music and also repetitive music. Which may, you know, goes back to sort of the jungle world, you know, back in the day, you know, uh, and and it sort of appealed to me. But it, I'd never played that. I'd never played music and practice. I'd kept the two se separate. Yeah, I was going to ask about that because I kept, I kept, I'd keep the it's two. It's very separate. different size of the brain. Yeah, yeah, thought. Yeah, 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 yeah. Never, never want to listen to music when I was playing. So, so is it, with, with snooker, when you play snooker, do you have to? It's, it's a very highly concentrated, very. Yeah, you're immersed. It's not free form, is it? No, no, you're immersed in you're immersed in in the, the table and the ball. So you, to to even think about having sort of uh, something that was taking your mind off it would be would be a, would be disrespectful to both activities, really. I think. But do you think in a way the way you approach music is almost sort of the same as the way you approach playing snooker? You, do you actually have a do you actually collect music? Think about it in terms. I have to listen to this, and I'm very you're very logical about getting to this new music. I think that's more the radio shows done that is, is polarised. Yeah, otherwise, I may be the same as other people. I may be just listening to my favourites and not investigating. I think, but doing the radio show has actually made it more urgent to make sure that we, we've got our finger on the pulse of what's yeah. out there. Mm. And that's and that's been that's been a wonderful experience because otherwise, I may not have been so active, proactive in buying new stuff and getting. So, but it does feed my addiction to vinyl, which I'm having therapy for. I don't know about you. I've got. I've, uh, once a month. It's not working very well. No, it's not it? working no. at all. <laughs> but, but Disco, I've, seen the, I've seen the vinyl wing. <laughs> Dic Disco <laughs> Discogs hasn't helped. Yeah, yeah I, 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 try, I try to only go on Discogs three times a week, but uh, I'm, yeah. down, I'm down to four. And is that buying old stuff and new stuff? Or? Yeah, but mainly new stuff now. Yeah. I yeah. think I've probably exhausted most of the old stuff. Would you say, would you say the kind of music, and we're loosely going to use this term again, prog, which I know we ever yeah, like no, to use yeah. music, but do you think there's a boom in that kind of music in the last three or four years? It's, well, there has been because of uh, uh, the you know, there's a prog music magazine out on the high street, which is which is uh, a great magazine. Yeah, so yeah, you know, it, um, and and uh, although you know, to their they, they have the same problem is that there's always the same people on the front covers. Yes, Genesis, Rick Waitman's there, and you know they they have to for, for people to go. Oh, I remember that. You know the nostalgia bit. Mm. So they they have the problem of trying to introduce new bands to a lot of their readers, but it's out there. So I think also also one thing that sort of changed was. Um, 
now that all music is available to everyone at, at any point. I mean, it's funny talking about Henry Cow earlier, because I remember I'd read about them uh, in about 1988, 1989, and, and I could not find, I was about you know, 17 years old, I couldn't find their records for Love Nor Money in Plymouth, where I grew up. And I remember, get, you know, putting around, oh, have you heard this band, Henry Cow? And finally, a, a friend had this brother who had a cassette who lent to me. It took me about, like, six months to find, and I'd already decided, that they, before I'd heard a no, I'd already decided they were going to be my favourite band. Well, why like it's just the name and yeah, the aura. Their name and yeah. Fred Frith, I knew uh, Naked City, John Zorn and Fred Frith was in that, so I thought, oh, yeah, you know, and then of course it, I heard it, and it was it was, it was like my new favourite band. But now you can any band, you know, third year band, Comus, any of these obscure things, type it in, you can hear it straight away, which is I think it completely sort of flattened. On the one hand, it sort of flattened that kind of excitement of discovering something and looking for it and having to find it. But on the other hand, it's taken away a lot of the stigma that that kind of music had. Because you didn't have to sort of commit to, you don't have to commit to spending 15, 20 quid on something that you don't know if it's like, an, oh, it's, oh, it's a bit dusty and 70s-ish. And so I think when you say about any resurgence, it not, not just prog, but any kind of cult music has, has really sort of come. I mean, think about any, anything from Throbbing Gristle to sort of Coil, anything is available to anyone now. So, and I, I do think the stigma, you know, even f I remember in, in the 80s, the idea of people who like jazz or folk music, that, to me, that was like the enemy. Mm. It's like, oh, do you like jazz? But the kids love jazz now because it's, again, the stigma's gone. The kids love folk. Folk seemed really kind of like, you know, it had, it had such a bad reputation in the 80s. It had this sort of cliche of people putting a finger in the air. I mean, I love folk music now, but there was no way I would have, in 1984... Well, well Prague had the worst. Well, yeah, I mean, that, that was, yeah, it did, yeah. It was a put-down yeah. word. Poss yeah. Possibly, yeah. you know, not, not entirely blameless for that. Though, but, you know. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, th I think people didn't really know what it was, did they? And I think... Yeah. Unfortunately for my generation, it was my generation caused this, but that was the, the dividing line between well, punk and prog. It, even though, even though now you look back and they overlap completely. Well, because yeah, I, yeah and it's funny because I started in 1980, really getting into music when I was about eight. Prog and punk had all been in the past, so I had to go backwards mm. for both of them. And I, I always sort of felt like punk came from the same place as prog. I mean, it was it was prog wasn't like on the right. People talk about well, punk came to kill prog. I think now I think punk came to kill things like. Pussycat and Brotherhood of Man and the stuff that was actually on the radio and on top of the pops. You wouldn't be hearing sort of, um, you know, matching mole on top of the pops or, in, or on TV or anything, you know. And I think it, all those bands like Faust and Can and Noi and then even like Roxy Music, they're all sort of fed into what was sort of happening with punk as well. So for me, I never really... It was all, it was all music that felt very sort of passionate and sincere and sort of personal, if anything. It, it, was, it was more like the straight music that I thought punk came mm. to kill. Well, did, did you feel like you... Did, did, it was at the time... Did, that was a feeling that, that was at, beforehand. All the prog stuff was like, you bored, bored, and you... You, you, you were not want... allowed to... You're not meant to like it, but everyone kind of sneakily liked it at the same time. Oh, really? Yeah, so it, was like... it was quite... Because no, growing up in a place like Blackpool, nobody actually knew what cool was. So you, you had to like think, is that meant to be cool or not? Yeah. All right. Yeah. Yeah. So people had the idea, and also quite, you, you knew that quite a lot of the punk records you were buying were actually far more complex than anybody was letting on. And you had bands that were sat right in the middle, like the Stranglers, who were kind of proggy anyway. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So they were punky, yeah. psychedelic, and they were right in the middle of the whole thing, really. So, so there was definitely those arguments going on, those battle lines. I mean, was, were those kind of discussions, I mean, you're, what, 58 now? Well, 60, thanks. 60, so you're slightly older. So um, were, were these discussions going on around you, or is it all... Well, what happened was, uh, um, as uh, prog came to an end, my interest in music for a while completely evaporated as I became totally immersed in snooker. So I turned professional in 1978, um, and I was really like, then it was just blinkers on, and don't think I listened to music for a while. Um, so what got you back? I think perhaps that's when it went to soul music. I sort of like you mm. picked it up and forgot all my record collection of what was in the past, and then and then went into you know, the jazz, jazz funk. We have Mole Jazz uh, in Kings mm. Cross was a, a record shop I started to go into and got some good recommendations for sort of you know like Ursula Dudziak and uh, Air Toe and all of those types and Brazilian stuff was quite interesting. The jazz and then that Robbie Vincent was, as I said before, was a massive in, in, you know and and then the soul artists, the small forty fives and the small labels and everything, and went down that that which, which rabbit one, hole really. For a snooker player, 
would seem more logical. You kind of, in your head, imagine, well, this guy's from Romford, he's a snooker player, he's going to like jazz funk. Well, I, mean, I suppose so. Yeah, yeah. There, was a great, there was a great record shop in Chadwell Heath called GIFs as well. So the, uh, it was a good area for it. The Essex boys uh, mm. were uh, quite strong in the soul. It was a very southern yeah. thing. Or Liverpool is what I did. But it was very much that area was jazz funk, wasn't it? It was, yeah. And of course, in the 70s, Northern Soul was, was, uh, was big, you know, in Blackpool and the Wigan and all that. But down mm. south, there was more jazz funky stuff. And I think I probably just got taken away down that road, but I, I still say I'd, I wish I'd have, not, not that I don't, you know, some wonderful soul music, I uh, love the stuff, but um, I wish I'd have carried on down the road of listening to alternative stuff. Which you can now, you can listen to both, can't you? Yeah, 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 but I still find myself listening to, um, I, I don't listen to too much soul music. You know, it's a little bit of a narrow band. You know, they're either singing about the woman they want to fall in love with uh, or whatever, or the one that they've just left because they were cheating. Whereas, whereas Magma... <laughs> well, I don't know. I don't, we, we don't know. Nobody knows. I don't know. Maybe Kobe is all about yeah, the possibly. woman he's in love with. Possibly it is. We will never know. We will never know. But, so uh, what sparked your interest back into Prague then? Was it, was it, was it just like a, just a random thing? You just heard something thought, wow, this, this is the path. I'm back on it again. Or is it I gradual got, process? I can't remember. Uh, uh, I was in a Virgin record shop, uh, which is a slightly bigger Virgin record shop to the original one I used to go into, well, up the back spiral staircase, uh, mega store in Tottenham Court Road, Oxford Street one. And I was just walking, wondering if we had a bit of time to kill, and I sort of went, oh, I wonder if there's any Magma records in, you know, big air, big, big selection. And I walked flick through, there was a, a record by Christian Vander for, of his new band offering. And I picked it up and listened to it. I thought, wow, they're still going. Mm. And, and, um, and that's when I actually, um, then went, oh, I've got to see Magma again. And I had enough money at the time that I could waste, and I hired them to come over to the Bloomsbury Theatre. The famous gigs. Yeah, yeah it was yeah, just yeah. great. And well, uh, you, you lost a lot of money. Yeah, I'd done my brains in. It was great. It was 14 <laughs> of them in the band. And the hotel bill was horrendous. But I had a great time. And we sold out the Bloomsbury Theatre, 500 people, like five, three days on the trot. And nobody knew if anybody was going to come. Just flown over to France. And I could have just. Yeah. Fl- I should have gone to France yeah. because I saved myself in a fortune. But what a, what a great state! Oh, it was great. Yeah, yeah. we had like, there was somebody came in. The first person walked in the door with his, with his original Afghan coat on, <laughs> uh, as if he'd never, you know, he'd never even sort of changed direction. And, and then another person walked in with a three-piece suit and a, and a briefcase. It's a bit like when they played Manchester a couple of years ago. Yeah, and the audience they looked like. Well, actually, I spoke to the audience and they said. It's the first time they've been doing gigging matches since 1974. <laughs> the last time Magma had played. Yeah. It really was the same. Yeah. Where about they play in Manchester? They've done two gigs now. They played uh, the Royal Roll of the Country Music, which is a great place, a theatre. It was a sat down okay, gig. Yeah. That was amazing. And then last time they played Band on the Band Wall. Of the Wall. Oh, yeah, yeah, I like yeah. Band on the Wall. Two yeah, nights yeah. there, yeah. Mm. yeah, so yeah. They, they play quite a lot now, don't they? Yeah, yeah. yeah they're, they're, they're playing well over the place. Sort of yeah. start or something. Well, no, I don't think I did. No, but there's a resurgence around the world. They've played in China and they've played in South America. They've got a big following. I think they've, they've, they've got to just put a record out on Southern Lord as well. Yeah, so yeah, so that, yeah, yeah. I mean, Stephen yeah. O'Malley's been put, put them on a few times, and we saw them. Well, they played that uh, big metal festival. Yeah, Hellfest, Hellf- yeah, because we, yeah, yeah. we DJed. They played at Cafe Otto last year, and, and we were chatting to them, and they were saying, actually, you know, since we've been playing Metal Fest, we just want to play Metal Fest because it's, it's the best audience. Sort of thing, yeah, they went they? down really well. Yeah, yeah, they said yeah. it was, you know, it was, it was amazing. Yeah, they, yeah, I mean, the, the fact that they've got interest in China. You, you can imagine all these, you know, the, this, this area that's untapped people, you know, the influences are coming to China. You, there's got to be now, there's probably cover bands, Henry Cow cover bands, Magma cover bands, all over China, all playing exactly the same stuff. Yeah. What does anyone no know perfect. about? This is normal music in the West. Yeah. <laughs> does anyone know about the music scene in China? This is a genuine question, because obviously, you know, it's by amazing me. Japanese underground stuff was just constantly, you know, not there like is, there is a good the two countries scene. at all. But, yeah. I mean, how, how would you hear about it and what's, what's going on? Email me after the show. Oh, right, OK. Wow, I'll tap into a few yeah. people, yeah. Right. Yes, yeah. please, yeah. So did Magma have any idea that you were a well-known sneaker player in the UK? Do they, or do they think this is kind of a weird... Uh, didn't have a clue really until all of a sudden they probably like did a bit more research and then they would what, what's going on here so I think initially I was a bit wary of well you know sort of you know what is it is it a publicity stunt, stunt or something because we got quite a lot of publicity for it mm. um, and Christian Vander was quite you know reserved and he sort of, you know, was quite shy and didn't want to say too much uh, even though he spoke better English than you gave but the, uh, Stella Vander um, was you know, spoke spoke was a spokesperson, and we got on really well. And uh, and and I tried to do as good a job as possible of put it, pr- promoting it, but wasn't a promoter. I've just basically just 
a when, fan. There you yeah. go, thanks. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, rem- I remember actually, uh, Yamaha in um, uh, in the main Yamaha centre in uh, wherever it's, what road it's in, but um, uh, they've they've turned up on the morning for rehearsals, and all of a sudden the the, tour, the, the, the road manager's gone. Um, Steve, the the, pl- the piano's crap. It's a house piano. He says he cut the, the pianist can't work with this. You can't. Uh, I went. Oh right. <laughs> now what? <laughs> And I phoned up Yamaha, and they they did such a, they they brought a proper grand piano, put it in, bailed me out of trouble. Wow! At short notice, and so they yeah. they were honestly to to this day, what a class thing to do. Just mm. wonderful thing to do at short notice, just in the you know, because somebody had requested, and they and I said, well, what do you want? He went, well, you've got a Yamaha. And and they were so pleased to do it, and I don't think they ever really properly thanked them in in one respect. But what a class act they were! Because they actually cared about yeah the, the music, yeah, and the thing. fact that yeah. it was, there was a concert that was going to go on, and it wasn't going to be any good unless yeah. So we gave them a big thanks on the day, but even so, it was still a, it was still a really good thing to do. You don't often hear a nice story from the music business. Do you? <laughs> <laughs> it's quite a ruthless business, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And you're, you're playing yeah. with a Gong now, aren't you? I am currently yeah. playing with Gong. Yeah. That was so a... this is. A, Sort of slightly parallel, can not it? So I guess you were a fan of Gong, even though you've been in Gong. I mean, Steve's yeah. not in a band, is he? But, he's, but it was, uh, the, the Steve, was Steve was kind of the conduit, though. Yeah. Actually. yeah, it was. Um... I oh, see so you got to Gong via Steve. No, 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 I was into yeah. him already. Yeah. Um, I was into him since I was a kid, and it was sort of in, in my DNA, really. Like, like I said, once that big explosion of the late 80s happened, then sort of anything far out was, was allowed, and Gong was something I was really into. But then um, it was about, I don't know, it must have been about six years ago. Steve rang me up and said, you'll never guess who's just got in touch that wants to come on the show. Gong, you know, they want David Allen to come on the show. It's like, geez, that's really? We were both really, really excited. And so we went and picked, uh, Steve came down to, they were rehearsing at the premises uh, on Hackney Road, and Steve came down and picked up David, and the three of us went, you know, went up to Brentford and just, you know, uh, got chatting, really, really liked the guy, you know, uh, got on extremely well. And we stayed in touch and, um, you know, t- took each other's numbers. And he, he was, over the next six months, he'd been te- he t- texted me quite a lot. And whenever he was in London, he'd say, hey, I'm doing a gig, do you want to come down? And Gong had played and I went to see them. And then I was down at Cafe Otto one night, he was doing a, an improvising thing with Marshall Allen from the, the orchestra. And I got there and David had, was already acting a little bit sort of funny and then said, oh, you know, I've just been thinking about this. I really want you to join Gong. I want you to play guitar in Gong. And I said, David, you've never heard me play. And he said, I don't need to. (laughs) Uh, Wow, that's brilliant. It was amazing, yeah. Yeah. Totally on instinct. Yeah, Yeah, and it was amazing. You know, he said, I feel like I need someone to bring fire. And there was, you know, we then had a a rehearsal, which went really, really well. Um, And there's a funny thing is that all, all through my life, since being a teenager, I would come up with these riffs and they're just too gongy, you know, and it's like, I can't, I can't use that, it sounds too much like gong, but it's a great riff, you know. And so we were at this rehearsal and I was just playing like a, playing something, he was going, hey, God, that's great, you got any more of them? I said, 15 years <laughs> worth, yeah, I've got loads more riffs like this, you know. He, he was a character who sadly passed away now, but what, what, a, what an alternative guy, and what a mm. chilled out guy. And um, we used, before we do a radio show in, in the Brentwood there, in the community station, uh, we used to go for something to eat in an Italian restaurant, which is really close to where they filmed The Only Way is Essex. And they've actually filmed some. So it's, it's, it's Essexy, you know. Yeah. Lovely restaurant. Normal people in there. OK. We were in there early, waiting for David. He walks in the door. He's got a coat, a long coat on. He's got uh, a cra- perhaps a cravat, I can't remember. He's got a red top hat with a black hand on the back, stapled, made out of paper. Right to 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 uh, ward off ne'er do wells from behind. That was the other. And and as he's walked in the door, the whole place it was a bit like in the western when the, the gunslinger walks in and everybody stops and the piano player goes like that. They look at these weirdos walked in the door. They don't see weirdos in Essex. They see Joey Essex walking in, right? So he's, and everyone went. And then. He's walked over to our table, and we had such a great laugh. It was such a great chat. Yeah, yeah. great fun. Yeah, I saw him play uh, Beautiful Days. I don't think you played that gig. It's no. probably about six, seven years ago. Yeah. He had a, like Cat Weasel, they had like a one, yeah, cat one weasel. piece yeah. on glue. Oh, yeah, yeah. Running yeah. around the stage like crazy. He must have been about 73 then. Well, I did yeah. say this was the extraordinary thing because, you know, this is, here was a guy that was two years older than my dad, 
and yet absolutely in the moment, completely sort of on it, mm. extremely kind of fit and just full of ideas. And it's like, man, this I've, I've got to have some of what this guy, and I've got to be around this guy and see what's sort of powering him because he's, you know, extraordinary energy to him. He um, stayed and, and he and watched he just, every band at the festival taking yeah, little notes. He's, he's, he's saying, who's this, who's that? He's, he's the like, real deal. It was, yeah. he, well, he was the real deal. Absolutely, you know, the most cosmic human being I've met and not in any kind of bogus way totally kind of like an enlightened guy and you just wanted to be around him and go well I just kind of you know it always felt like he was a teacher really well I, and here's a guy who's been just playing gigs being in bands improvising keeping it absolutely sort of completely grassroots the whole time never selling out never going down the sort of rock star route and really basically living out of a suitcase and it's and still and he must have been at this point riddled with cancer when we were doing gigs together he didn't get diagnosed until he, he came back home from this tour that we'd done in Brazil at the time. And he was doing like four costume changes a night, packing up all his amp and everything, and then got home and got diagnosed with this cancer. It's like, man, you were, you were doing all this then. And you know, I mean, I, I sensed he knew that it was maybe the end days for him in Gong because he kept saying, well, you know, I can't do this forever and I need someone to take over from me. And I think that was part of the reason he wanted to get me involved. But um, when he got ill and couldn't, we had this big tour booked. And uh, he couldn't honour the tour because he was too ill. He said, like, and we just put out a record. So he said, like, you, you guys have to tour without me. And I'm, I was really reluctant to do it because I just thought it was, I, I didn't like the idea of this, like, gone without David Allen. And I thought, oh, no one's going to buy into this. But we, but we had a record out, we had to promote it. And uh, quite a few of the gigs had cancelled. So we had maybe 11 European dates. So I said, okay, well, look, I'll do it. I'll front this band for these dates. But after that, I'm out. You know, I can't. I don't like it when you get these kind of no original members or bands. But it was really, really good, and the the reaction to it was really good, and it felt kind of. It sort of felt like, yeah, this is Gong. This does feel like Gong. It doesn't. I, I you know, I didn't think I could go and step into the shoes of David Adam and try and be like him. But for whatever for whatever it is, it it feels like Gong and. Loads of the ex-members have, have come to see us and played with us. Steve Hillage has played with us and they're just like, yep, this is totally gone. Was that a bit this nerve wracking Yeah. Well, do, you, <laughs> do, do you know what? It, it, it sort of wasn't. It should have been. He's a pretty nice guy. He's a lovely yeah. guy, yeah. yeah. Well, he, we, we've, we, we're doing more gigs with him now, you know. Yeah, and, yeah. And it's, uh, it should have felt nerve wracking but he's just, he's another head. He's a... He's another far out says, musician. I mean, Gong's not a band, really. You're invoking the spirit of Gong. He's creating, yeah. Uh, yeah. creating a spirit in a space, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, Gong's an idea. So it doesn't matter who's playing it, as no. long as the spirit's there. As long as the idea. Yeah. It's, Gong is an idea, and I think David really couldn't bear the idea that this, that was the thought that this idea he had in the mid 60s had, had to finish with, with him sort of passing away. Mm. So it's, it's, it's kind of the ultimate statement. Yeah. Way, yeah. <clears throat> Interesting, though, how many people that say they're prog fans don't. Never listen to Gong. There's a weird Gong. Or, a or flip side of that, it's interesting how many people in punk loved Gong. Yeah. Oh, really? We always saw them as a proto punk band. Wow. And Hawkwood as well. They were always, yeah. always yeah. Hawkwood as well. So they were, t they were both two very similar, not musically totally similar. The spirit of both bands are similar though, isn't it? And certainly yeah. doing stuff with Here and Now, once that we you split Gong up, mm. they, they were, it's kind of like the Camembert Electric, it's kind of proto punk, kind mm. of very, punk very, record. very, yeah, yeah. yeah. Und underrated by yeah, a lot of people, not, not, not noted as much as it should be, and things. Yeah. So, did he tell you about how he showed Sibera at the Glissando? Yeah, no, well, no, no, he got the Glissando from Sid. He saw there's always, Sid the, there's always a bit of a. Well, yeah. basically, he saw Sid with the with the zippo. Um, at the, maybe it was the uh, at the UFO, I think, because he was, mm. you know, he, he, David was a massive Sid Barrett fan, and he said, I remember he told me he took, he took LSD and saw them at the um, at the Ali Pali when they were doing that twenty four hour mm. thing, and said he was just tripping and watching Pink Floyd, and said it was it was like electric Bartok. He just thought this is the future, but he saw Sid doing the thing with the zippo, and then he just sort of developed the glissando from that. But, um, and then Steve Hillage sort of took it, I think, developed it again. But, yeah, I think it was, the, you know, just David seeing the thing that Sid did. But Sid was kind of as much by accident and design, I think, just... Because uh, they were friends, weren't they? No, no, no they're not really. They knew each other. I think mm. David was rather in awe of Sid. Uh, because I said, oh, did, did you meet him? Did you? But he said, oh, we, st we, we stared at each other once we were both on acid, you know. But... <laughs> 
things have changed. That's the whole conversation you need at that time. Think, isn't it? Things have changed at Ali Pali. So it's it's yeah, not too it's much not... LSD taken at the snooker event in the Masters <laughs> in January. Not, not yet, though, you don't, as you see. You don't see the referee not well knowing where the balls go. So these colours are great on the table. They're all sort of merging quite nicely. Did that thought actually occur to you when the Ali Pali? I didn't, I didn't even know there was music on there. But... Uh, no, it's, it's strange that place has become sort of, you know, a, a, a yeah, massive this... darts event and the snooker event there. But obviously over the years, it's held some Amazing. fantastic still, music. still does actually yeah. quite good exactly. Actually, on the, on the back staircases, to, you know, over Ali Pali, there's like loads of big pictures of things they've had on music over the years. So it's quite I saw quite Sleep enough. and Slayer at Ali Pali. No way. Back. Not on the same bill. On the same bill and Melvin's. Wow, that's yeah, a weird it's bill. really good. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's no, You haven't done the Roundhouse? Yeah, the snooker at the Roundhouse. Did no, you do no, no. I've been back to the Roundhouse. I, prefer, I think I preferred it when it was uh, the old-fashioned bit with all the steps and it was... Oh, it's an amazing venue, though. You know, yeah, just... although I never felt the sound was brilliant there if you're standing outside. It kind of goes beyond the sound just because the history yeah. of it. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. I mean, that's, so. that's, that's one of those stages you can kiss that stage, can't yeah, you? Yeah, yeah. Even if it's the wrong stage, but... Have you, have you played there? Yeah, I've done a few sports okay, in there, yeah. yeah. Couldn't headline, it's a little yeah, big. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but it never used to be that big, so... They're probably, oh, probably they, they widened it out, did they? Yeah, I yeah. think so. I, I seem to remember it was just the steps... To the um, it was the turning circle for the trains, wasn't it? That's, yeah, to yeah. go back up north. About yeah. only twenty years though. Yeah. yeah, but I think it was all just they were all concrete steps. All I remember was your, your ass just went to sleep when you was watching, like really low steps, like and you just had to sit on them with the stamp on your hand, and that was it. First stamp on my ever stamp. Yeah. Do you, what are the gigs you go to at that time? Seventy five, seventy six. I was going to Magma. Gentle Giant, Caravan, Hatfield and the North, Henry, K, all, all of the Canterbury bands. Robert Wyatt. Mm -hmm. uh, um, I think I saw. I was at the the. The, the do they had at, um, I think it was the New London Theatre for like to, to raise money for him when they all turned out and he came on stage after like, falling out of the window and uh, mm. in a wheelchair and then of course after that then one of the greatest albums of all time Rock Bottom oh, was God, yeah, was made yeah. you know it was, it was part of my part of my life story was that album and appreciating Rock Bottom was just it's funny yeah. but Virgin isn't it that label uh, what. Um, it was the a reputation label. Virgin has yeah. now. What, what that label actually put out those early records. I mean, as well as you know, Gong, but like Faust, Hatfield and North, Robert Wyatt, and then and then going up to like Sex Pistols and XTC and, and what have you. It was a, it was a really good label, you know. Yeah. Uh, All the way to about nineteen ninety. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Camembert Electric was was being sold for fifty seven pence, or the, the price of a single. They, there was a, there's a lost leader, same mm. as they did with the Faust. The Faust tapes, well. yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, Camembert Electric was a fifty nine pence, whatever it was. And uh, somewhere down the line, I was sitting with Richard Branson at a, a charity dinner in London and didn't have much in common to say. There wasn't much talking, but I did say to him, I used to go in your shop back in the day. He went, oh, right, OK. I said, uh, have you ever thought about perhaps doing the similar thing to the, the Camembert Electric album? You know, put out an album for really cheap for somebody. He went, oh, I'll consider that. Yeah. So I think he's thinking, what record? We never said anything more. <laughs> he didn't I, seem in particular to can't imagine he knew any of those records. I think it was, yeah. I think well, my understanding was, it's it was the other Simon guy. Draper that was, was yeah. the, the guy that really mm. knew about the music. I think Richard Bantam was just the, yeah. but you know, he, the guy he, who wanted to have a label. But we didn't, get, we didn't go off on one talking about music after that introduction. So. I think the last thing you can have a conversation with Richard Branton is music. I know nothing about hot air balloons, so... Job done. Do you find that frustrating in that world that the other world you exist in that you can't have that musical conversation? But or is or is another unlikely sort of closet odd music fan? Every now and again, you you get so. I don't think there's any in the snooker world really. I mean, everybody likes music, but mm -hmm. it depends on what styles of music you like. But there's, there's no there's nobody else who's. No, we're not being snobs here. We're not saying. No, really. no, not at yeah. all. No, but there's, there's nobody coming up to me saying, uh, "Oh, here, Art Zoid's got a new box set out." You know, nobody's yeah. doing that. So, <laughs> <laughs> really, yeah, uh, they have. Um, um, <laughs> it's a monster, right? Uh, but nobody's bothered. Um, no, so my snookery, the snookery world is just, they're all, they're, they're all on a mission. And, 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 and I, I've still got that, I'm still a snooker fan, but it's, it's nice when you bump into people that, um, that have got, you know, got the same passion as you. So every now and again you'll get a fan who also is a, a music fan, but no other snooker players are. I sure have read somewhere there was a thing <coughs> where the snooker players, they, they come on, it's not a stage, is it? But to the table with with, with the music in there, and everyone pick their piece of music. We all have to walk. We all have to walk out the music. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. and the, the piece of you picked 
<laughs> what's, what's the piece they're well, looking for? <laughs> well, no, no. I mean, the, the, you know, they all come out to the inspirational, you know, M&M's, one chance, get to play, you know, a bit of dry ice and, and uh, happy. Was Everybody walking out to happy and, and everybody sort of going, oh, he's got better music in him. It's like, quite sad, really. And they said, what music do you want? I went, OK, well, Art Zoid uh, actually did a soundtrack to uh, Nosferatu. And there's a bit where in the film where in the black and white film where the vampire comes in there, the big the big reveal where the first time you see the vampire and the bit of music is quite dramatic. So I walked out to that. It just didn't go down very well, you know. Just... <laughs> <laughs> but to give him credit, uh, Stephen Hendry, who's got the image of being like, you know, pretty miserable, and he's not he's a funny bloke, but he, mm. he, he wanted to walk out to the Smiths, heaven knows I'm miserable now. Oh, uh, yeah, playing yeah, with his yeah, image. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, but they wouldn't allow it because they wanted it to all be upbeat. So. Oh, OK, so it's very controlled, show business. Kind well, of, that's yeah. the idea. I don't know how much they wouldn't if he'd have put his foot down, but he, he wasn't bothered anyway. It's sort of, you know, get the music out of the way, it's nothing to do with snooker anyway. Have you, have you ever met Stuart Pearce? He's another, sort of, obviously a very famous sportsman who's got music taste that people don't expect to have. He's a very big punk fan. Oh, really? No, yeah. I don't know. How, um, no, uh, uh, Dennis, uh, is a, 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 a cricketer, was massively into reggae. Dennis uh, Glasses... Ooh, uh, you mean, you mean, massive yeah. reggae used to go yeah. in a reggae shop in um, Soho. Um, but no, not too many people. No, no. Because the sports such a dedication, there's not time to get... Well, it's whether you bump into them in your life. I think, yeah, but, but for really. people to actually have the time to investigate the forms of music like you have, most people don't do that because they're so on the sport. No, I, I think, yeah, well, everybody's got hobbies, haven't they? You just don't know what, what the hobby's going to be. Oh, so it could, could be, be fishing. Or I, had could a, be... I was at the Prog Awards a few years back. I did a little column in Prog magazine, so I got invited along. And um, I got put on the same table as Fish. Me and Fish, we had a fish chat. Fish out of Meridian. We were a lovely guy, lovely guy. We were like that, lovely yeah. guy. We had a chat. Obviously, I'm not going to talk to him about music. It's like somebody talking to you about snooker. But we started talking about gardening. Was... He's got a massive allotment up in Scotland where he lives. And basically, he's got 25 plots of land growing vegetables. He's got vegetables coming out of his eyes. He's got, he's got so many vegetables, he supplies everybody in the village. I mean, he was talking about soil composition and everything. That's his hobby. It was great. And I was loving listening to what he was talking about, his hobby. I was thinking, and he sort of more or less said, yeah, you should do it yourself. And I'm going, yeah. I'll... But no, I calmed down after that because I'm not interested in gardening. Yeah, yeah. But you... for a split second, his enthusiasm rubbed off. So would you say a hobby is the thing you really want to do? Or are you kind of lucky you can do... You've got two hobbies. Yeah, one, I know, one yeah, makes, I've been very lucky, yeah. giving you a very good living and one's giving you an amazing yeah. passion. Well, I think a lot of people would like their hobby to be their profession, but I already got that, so I was very fortunate. But the hobby I've really got involved in is one that's a non-skill one, which is collecting music and listening. Mm. So I like that as a sort of foil to it, so they can work together. And you've never been tempted to actually make music then? Well, other than... Other than, uh, yes, well, well, OK, so, so uh, Carvis has got a record label called Believer's Roast, OK, uh, which he puts out loads of stuff and loads of great music from friends and people. And he went, I've, I've reserved uh, number 13 in the catalogue for your first modular synth album. Well, we've gone past, we've gone past the... OK, well, yeah. Yeah. Oh, you've got, oh, sorry, okay, sorry. Well, sorry. <laughs> so I, you know, I had a little dabble, but I, I bought a modular synth. Oh, it's great. I haven't got a clue what I'm doing. You have to put wires in and put them in other holes and, and, and it's a complete learning curve, mind-boggling mm. thing. Um, but there's no dexterity needed because that's what I'm not going to be able to... You know, there's no way I'm going to start doing that. But putting these things in and getting these, these like riffs going and patches going, as they call them, in the trade, mm. right? Uh, it's great fun. I love it. Yeah, so... So, yeah, the 12 inches coming out. Yeah, right. Well, it's funny you said earlier, because you were saying earlier, well, I'm, I'm not a musician, but, I mean, the first time I met you, or early on meeting you, I was thinking, he seems, Steve sort of seems like a musician. I mean, you didn't, don't seem like a civilian. I mean, bluffing. All my, all, most bluffing. of my friends are musicians, and musicians are freaks, right? You know, and they're kind of, you know, if you're ever somewhere... No, it sounds so snobby, but if I'm at somewhere like a party or something and then there's another musician there, like, oh, thank God, thank God, there's someone who isn't a civilian. I can, t I can just, just talk about music all night and they're going to be perfectly happy to do that. You know, I can't talk about normal stuff. Sure, so, being, I mean, being a musician is a fan plus dedication. Yeah. Right? Yeah, they, but what I love about musicians, yeah, yeah, all musicians yeah, yeah. talk about is music. I mean, it's just, you know, that, what else is there, you know? Mm. You know your feelings, you know, <laughs> politics, you know. So, so and I love the, the, the idea of, you know, when you see another one, as soon as you've got a, as soon as you've got a way in with, a, you, you know, you, you, you fish around the edges and you find an album in common and then boom, I can, I can be talking to that person all night about her. And, uh, but it's often uh, people, if they're not like that, I, just, I can't really get on a, 
you know, I don't know if it's a, if it's me being on some sort of spectrum or whatever. But uh, we're meeting Steve. Yeah. Take this, yeah. take this, to, take this right, the best yeah. way. <laughs> but I was Steve's like, oh god, he's, oh, he's one of us. Yeah, yeah, he's a, he's, he's a nutter about me. But also, <laughs> to say he's very musical. Sometimes we'll be playing records on the show. And there'll be these Im improbable sort of melodies or these completely impossible kind of counting. And you'll be there whistling the melody completely accurately and, and tapping out like a 13-8 or whatever. Did, was it 13-8? Well, right. well, 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 I, know, I know drummers. I know drummers that, can't, oh, yeah, okay. that can't get their head around that. And I know singers who can't get their head around some of the sort of big skips, really, melodic skips you that you it. just sort of... So I think you hear you are you are a musician. I, I, listen, I, I feel much more at home to, amongst people that are music people than than actually amongst my own. Now it's quite strange. Uh, when you wonder how you, but I, was, I fell in love with snooker. But the laddie snooker player who who also likes football and horse racing, I don't feel I've got much in common with in a way because sometimes you're sitting around in the snooker world. Love all of them. I've got the same interest in some ways, but I don't want to talk about football. I don't, I'm not interested. I'm just not interested in a game where people just fall over fresh air. And I, I don't care about the team. It's of no interest whatsoever. And I don't care what horse beat or another horse. It's just of no interest whatsoever. But if somebody's talking about music, I'm much more willing to go for them. Well, that, yeah. In the snooker world, you just talk about snooker. Well, they don't mean, yeah. Or yeah. gardening. Well, they do. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, talk about snooker. That's our life. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah, yeah. But then, other than that, then the chat in the players' room will be about other sport. You know, it'll be about... Football teams and shit. Mm, it's you know, it's a bit more difficult. And yeah. I love them as well. And, I, and I'm not saying I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm like them, but I don't want to talk. You know, I want to talk about music stuff if I'm, if I got the chance. Mm. Yeah. And what, what about you, snooker? Have you ever played snooker? Oh, hopeless. But I'd, completely um, <laughs> unrelated to knowing Steve, it was the only. I'm not interested in any sort of sport at all. But I love snooker. That was. It seemed like the most sort of. I think it's for me. It's where sport meets art, or it's like the, it is like it's the most psychedelic of games. It's, it's total, you know, angles, and you know, I've always really, really loved it. Well, listen, come so, to Alexander Palace of the well, Masters, take some LSD. You can, yeah, you can get back to the old days. Yeah, sounds good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Just go sit in the front row because it'll be obvious. Go up the back. I thought you were offering him a game. No, he's on LSD. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, that, no, that could be something. Yeah, yeah. maybe yeah. I'd be good. Maybe I'd see the angles, you know. Maybe you think you'd be good. Maybe that's it. I'm hopeless. I finally, finally, to wrap up, I just want to talk about you. you've been out DJ in, in, in clubs. So, would you talk about clubs that? Clubs and festivals. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, how does that work? Do you want, do you play all types of music, or do you just keep yeah. it based on the radio show? No, no, or? no, no, no. Bangers. I mean, we'll play anything from sort of post punk, you know, Killing Joke, This Heat, Fugazi, uh, Magma, Vador, Public Enemy. Um, yeah, a mixture, a mixture a of stuff. Yeah. Noi, you know, just a total mixture of bangers. A, a, lo loads of obscure stuff, sort of Japanese stuff, typographica. Um, j j yeah. Honestly, just a, two or three hours when we play of what we think are complete bangers, but not, not, um, not, not tied together with any genre, other than that they're just really brilliant, groovy records that you wouldn't necessarily expect to hear in a club or at a festival. But people people will be dancing. I mean, we, we get kind of... Some people are a bit freaked out by it, but largely I think people just get into kind of what we're doing. And I think we're getting better at being able to sort of know what record will follow another one to really sort of build something up. But instead of it's just not kind of traditional dance music. Mm. It's, it's, mm. Been, it's been a great, great journey for me because all of a sudden you're there as a DJ, like the party bit, and, and it's just have a, have a dance. I mean, I've, I've, never, I've never even... even even smiled on the snooker t t television as a snooker player. I wouldn't even give one iota of emotion away. But a different world. You have mm. so much fun doing it. The only thing is sometimes we get we get put bracketed as electronic D or techno things because we first, the first one we ever did was the Block Weekend, um, which is an electronic music festival. But I think slowly sort of we've got in our own niche. But we've been told recently that we're not we're not DJs. We're selectors. We're selectors. Yeah. We can't we can't mix. <laughs> we can't mix that. a cake. Well, yeah, but, can, but that means it's not made to be mixed. No. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, no. mixing's a skill, but yeah. you don't have to mix to be a DJ. Do you? But Surely. I think techno DJ probably has to know how to mix two mm, records because early. because our music works. Yeah. And that. yeah. So our yeah. skill factor is being able to make sure that we don't take the record off we're playing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, which on occasions I have done. But that was in the early years. I'm over that now. Yeah. Because the deathly silence when you take off the record you're playing is so embarrassing. Or I've, I sometimes as well queued up a record and then press play on the CD player. Like, <laughs> so there's a little, got, little yeah. bit of <laughs> shambolic quality yeah. to it. But no, yeah. I mean, it's, just been, it's been amazing <laughs> and we really, really enjoy it. And I think Glastonbury. We did Glastonbury oh, twice. Glastonbury. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. that was ridiculous. 
There's a WTF thing still going on about... A, what, what, what the what? WTF? Really? Snooker player? But it's, we're getting over that now, so it's good. Yeah, yeah. I think yeah. the first year we did it, it was probably people saw it as a, as a novelty. I mean, maybe they still do, but it was when the second year we were still getting booked yeah. for festivals. I think word's actually sort of getting out that, yeah, they, these two put on a pretty wild show. I mean, I, I don't know anyone else who does the sort of set that we do. Um, and, and you meet uh, some lovely people as well. We, well. We've made some really cool friends. Yeah, I mean, we? I had to buy, I bought youth a beer. Oh, yeah, that was... <laughs> I, I, yeah, I can see him gravitating towards yeah, that it tent. Okay. Yeah. yeah. It was for yeah. somebody else, but he, com he nodded and commandeered it. I went, OK. You're not going to look where <laughs> you It was another mate of ours, beer. But it's more of the other guys lost a beer to youth. Well, you know, yeah. Didn't we all? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, we're finished. So thanks a lot. Pleasure. Thank yeah. you, pleasure. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Steve. Well, thank you. That's right. <laughs> well, edit that fucker down. <laughs> <laughs>